The watch sat around the big table in the gods' room, and in deep gloom. They were off-duty. They'd never really been off-duty before. Let's say we have a game of cards, said Nobby brightly. He produced a greasy pack from somewhere in the noisome recesses of his uniform. You won everyone's wages off them yesterday, said Sergeant Colon. Now's the chance to win them back, then. Yeah, but there were five kings in your hand, Nobby. Nobby shuffled the cards. It's funny that, he said. There's kings everywhere when you look. There certainly is if you look up your sleeve. No, I mean, there's king's way in ank, and kings in cards, and we get the king's shilling when we join up, said Nobby. We got kings all over the place, except on that gold throne in the palace. I'll tell you, there wouldn't be all this trouble around the place if we had a king. Carrot was staring at the ceiling, his eyebrows locked in concentration. Detritus was counting on his fingers. Oh, yes, said Sergeant Colin. Beer would be a penny a pint. The trees would bloom again. Oh, yeah, every time someone stubs a toe in this town, turns out it wouldn't have happened if there'd been a king. Vines would go spare to hear you talk like that. People would listen to a king, though, said Nobby. For I'm to say, that's the problem, said Colin. It's like that thing of his about using magic. That stuff makes him angry. How do you get king in the first place, said Detritus. Someone sawed up a stone, said Colin. Huh, anti-silicanism? Nah, someone pulled a sword out of a stone, said Nobby. How do you know it was there, then? Colin demanded. It, it was sticking out, wasn't it? Where anyone could have grabbed it, in this town? Only the rightful king could do it, see, said Nobby. Oh, right, said Colin. I understand. Oh, yes. So what you're saying is someone decided who the rightful king was before he pulled it out. Hmm? Sounds like a fix to me. Probably someone had a fake hollow stone and some dwarf inside hanging on the other end with a pair of flyers until the right guy came along. A fly bounced on the window pane for a while, then zigzagged across the room and settled on a beam where Cuddy's idly thrown axe cut it in half. You got no soul, Fred, said Nobby. I wouldn't have minded being a knight in shining armor. That's what a king does if you're useful. It makes you a knight. A knight watchman in crappy armor is about your metier, said Colin, who looked around proudly to see if anyone had noticed the slanty thing over the E. Nah, catch me being respectful to some bloke because he just pulled a sword out of a stone. That don't make you a king. Mind you, he said, someone who could shove a sword into a stone. A man like that. Now he's king. A man like that will be ace, said Nobby. Angua yawned. Ding, ding, a ding, ding. What the hell's that? said Colin. Carrot's chair thumped forward. He fumbled in his pocket and pulled out a velvet bag, which he upended on the table. Out slid a golden disc, about three inches across. When he pressed the catch on one side, it opened like a clamshell. The stopped watch peered at it. It's a clock, said Angua. A watch, said Carrot. It's very big. That's because of the clockwork. There has to be room for all the little wheels. The small watches just have those little time demons in, and they don't last, and anyway, they keep rotten time. Ding, ding, a ding, 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 a ding, ding. And it plays a tune, said Angua. Every hour, said Carrot. It's part of the clockwork. Ding. Ding, ding. And it chimes the hours afterwards, said Carrot. It's slow, then, said Sergeant Colin. Oh, the others just struck. You couldn't miss them. My cousin Jorgen makes ones like these, said Cuddy. They keep better time than demons or water clocks or candles, all those big pendulum things. There's a spring and wheels, said Carrot. The important bit, said Cuddy, taking an eyeglass from somewhere in his beard and examining the watch carefully, is a little rocking thingamy that stops the wheels from going too fast. How does it know if they're going too fast? said Angua. It's kind of built in, said Cuddy. I don't understand it much myself. What's this inscription here? He read it aloud. A watch from your old friends in the watch. It's a play on words, said Carrot. There was a long, embarrassed silence. Um, I chipped in a few dollars each from you new recruits, he added, blushing. I mean, you can pay me back when you like. If you want to. I mean, you'd be bound to be friends. Once you get to know him. The rest of the watch exchanged glances. 
He could lead armies, Angua thought. He really could. Some people have inspired whole countries to great deeds because of the power of their vision. And so could he. Not because he dreams about marching hordes or world domination or an empire of a thousand years. Just because he thinks that everyone's really decent underneath and would get along just fine if only they made the effort. And he believes that so strongly it burns like a flame which is bigger than he is. He's got a dream, and we're all part of it, so that it shapes the world around him. And the weird thing is, is that no one wants to disappoint him. It'd be like kicking the biggest puppy in the universe. It's a kind of magic. The gold's rubbing off, said Cuddy. But it's a good watch, he added quickly. I was hoping we could give it to him tonight, said Carrot. And I'll go for, uh, drink. Not a good idea, said Angua. Leave it until tomorrow, said Colin. We'll form a guard of honor at the wedding. That's traditional. Everyone holds their swords up in a kind of arc. We've only got one sword between us, said Carrot glumly. They all stared at the floor. It's not fair, said Angua. I don't care who stole whatever they stole from the assassins, but he was right to try to find out who killed Mr. Hammerhawk and no one cares about lettuce nibs. I'd like to find out who shoot me, said Detritus. Beats me why anyone would be daft enough to steal from the assassins, said Carrot. That's what Captain Vime says. He said you'd have to be a fool to think of breaking into that place. They stared at the floor again. Like clown or jester, said Detritus. Detritus, he didn't mean a cap and bells full, said Carrot in a kindly voice. He just meant you'd have to be some sort of it. He stopped. He stared at the ceiling. Oh my, he said. It's as simple as that? Simple as what? said Angua. Someone hammered at the door. It wasn't a polite knock. It was the thumping of someone who was either going to have the door opened for them or break it down. A guard stumbled into the room. Half his armor was off and he had a black eye, but he was just recognizable as Scully Muldoon of the Day Watch. Colin helped him up. Been in a fight, Scully? Scully looked up at Detritus and whimpered. The buggers attacked the watch house! Who? Oh, them! Carrot patted him on the shoulder. This isn't a troll, he said. This is Lance Constable Detritus. Don't salute! Trolls attack the day watch? They're chucking cobbles! You can't trust them, said Detritus. Who? said Scully. Trolls. Nasty pieces of work in my opinion, said Detritus, with all the conviction of a troll with a badge. They need keeping a eye on. What happened to Quirk? said Carrot. I don't know. You lot have to do something. We're stood down, said Colin. Official! Don't give me that! Ah, said Carrot brightly. He pulled out a stub of pencil out of his pocket and made a little tick in his black book. You still got that little house in Easy Street, Sergeant Muldoon? What? What? Yes! What about it? Is the rent worth more than a farthing a month? Muldoon stared at him with his one operating eye. Are you simple or what? Are you simple or what? Carrot gave him a big smile. That's right, Sergeant Muldoon. Is it, though? Worth a farthing, would you say? There's dwarves running around the streets looking for a fight, and you want to know about property prices? A farthing? Don't be daft! It's worth at least five dollars a month! Ah, said Carrot, taking the book again. There'll be inflation, of course, and I expect you've got a cooking pot. Uh, do you own at least two and one-third acres and more than half a cow? All right, all right, said Muldoon. It's some kind of joke, right? I think probably the property qualification can be waived, said Carrot. It says here it can be waived for a citizen in good standing. Finally, has there been, in your opinion, an irreparable breakdown of law and order in the city? They turned over Throat Dibbler's Barrow and made him eat two of his sausages in a bun. Oh, I say, said Colin, without mustard. I think we can call that a yes, said Carrot. He ticked the page again and closed the book with a definite snap. We'd better be going, he said. We were told, Colin began. According to the laws and ordinances of Ankh-Morpork, said Carrot, 
Any residents of the city in times of the irreparable breakdown of law and order shall, at the request of an officer of the city who is a citizen in good standing, there's a lot of stuff here about property and stuff and then it goes on, form themselves into a militia for city defense. What does that mean? said Angua. Militia, mused Sergeant Colon. Hang on, you can't do that, said Muldoon. That's nonsense. It's the law. Never been repealed, said Carrot. We've never had a militia. Never needed one. Until now, I think. Now look here, said Muldoon. You come back with me to the palace. You're men of the watch. And we're going to defend the city, said Carrot. People were streaming past the watch house. Carrot stopped the couple by the simple expedient of sticking out his hand. Mr. Popley, isn't it? he said. How's the grocery business? Hello, Mrs. Popley. Ain't you heard? said the flustered man. The trolls have set fire to the palace! He followed Carrot's gaze up Broadway, to where the palace stood squat and dark in the early evening light. Ungovernable flames failed to billow from every window. My word, said Carrot. And there's dwarves breaking windows and everything, said the grocer. A dog's not safe! You can't trust him, said Cuddy. The grocer stared at him. Are you a dwarf? he said. Amazing! How do people do it? said Cuddy. Well, I'm off. I'm not stopping to see Mrs. Popley ravished by the little devils. You know what they say about dwarfs. The watch watched the couple head off into the crowd again. Well, I don't, said Cuddy to no one in particular. What is it they say about dwarfs? Carrot fielded a man pushing a barrow. Would you mind telling me what's going on, sir? He said. And do you know what it is they say about dwarfs? Said a voice behind them. That's not a sir. That's Root, said Colin. And will you look at the color of him? Should he be all shiny like that? Said Detritus. Feeling fine, feeling fine, said Dibbler. Ha! Ah, so much for people importuning the standard of my merchandise. What's happening, Throat? Said Colin. They say, Dibbler began, green in the face. Who says? Said Carrot. They say, said Dibbler. You know, they. Everyone! They say the trolls have killed someone up at Dolly's sisters, and the dwarves have smashed up Chalky the Trolls all night pottery, and they've broken down the brass bridge, and... Carrot looked up the road. You just came over the brass bridge, he said. Yeah, well, that's what they say, said Dibbler. Oh, I see. Carrot straightened. Did they happen to say, sort of, in passing, anything else about dwarves? said Cuddy. I think we're going to have to go and have a word with the Day Watch about the arrest of Coalface, Carrot said. We ain't got no weapons, said Colin. I'm certain Coalface has nothing to do with the murder of Hammerhawk, said Carrot. We are armed with a truth. And what can harm us if we're armed with a truth? Well, a crossbow bolt can, e.g., go right through your eye and out the back of your head, said Sergeant Colin. All right, Sergeant, said Carrot. So where do we get some more weapons? <laughs>